Um, uh, I titled my presentation Verbal Morphology of Conderable Cell, that's pretty self explanatory. My aim was to determine the uh, verb paradigm of vos, um, a second person pronoun uh, in Honduran Spanish. And as a form of introduction, I will give you some preliminary facts that you need to keep in mind as I proceed with my presentation, as well as a historical background on this pronoun, and finally, its current use in Central America. Um, Spanish, as we might all know, uh, presents three second person singular subject pronouns, usted, tu, and vos, and these are all equivalent to the single singular you in English. Their use uh, differs socio-pragmatically uh, by country, uh, and it will depend on, uh, well, in general terms, usted, um, right here, uh, is used in formal contexts. It's used uh, as a pronoun of deference and social distance as well. And then the other two, tu and vos, they're used in informal contexts and uh, as a sign of solidarity and intimacy in varying degrees. Uh, especially in the countries that use vos, uh, the, the mood of the interlocutors, the topic, the uh, social status, the social distance, age, gender, all of those factors come into play of what pronoun you're going to be using. 71% of uh, the Spanish-speaking countries uh, is Mosiante, meaning that they use both to a certain extent. And 43% uses both extensively. Previous studies have focused mainly on South America, especially the Rio de la Plata region, um, where Bos is actually a prestigious form, um, and also in Chile because it has presented some interesting um, phenomena there. But regions such as Central America, and especially countries, small countries like Honduras, have not been studied very much. And that is why I wanted to provide up-to-date data coming from such countries. So let me uh, talk a little bit about the Honduran variety of Spanish. It is virtually unified. It's a virtually unified dialect. And by this, I refer to um, the urban dialects. Uh, so in, in Honduras, we can see two very distinct dialects, the urban and the rural. And um, the urban one, the urban dialects will differ mostly in the lexical um, sphere. Here you have a map of Honduras, and I will uh, explain in detail a little bit uh, why why we have why I'm saying that we have a unified dialect. Uh, we have three large cities, or the largest um, for the country, small country. Um, in comparison to the United States, that would be small. But anyway, uh, uh, El Ciudad is the capital city. It has over a million people. San Pedro Sula, where the study was conducted, uh, has about a million people. And then La Ceiba uh, has under a million people, and that's the third largest. All of these um, cities are very well interconnected socially because, uh, especially San Pedro Sula and Teusia, but they are both uh, cultural centers. They're both social centers of the country. So people from Teusialpa and San Pedro Sula and even La Ceiba will be going back and forth from one city to the next for different reasons. Uh, in addition, San Pedro Sula is considered the uh, industrial center. So if you're working in factories and such, you might actually travel every day from Teusialpa to San Pedro Sula or from La Ceiba to San Pedro Sula. Teusialpa is the capital, so it's the political center. If you need to do administrative paperwork and such, then you go to the Ucigalpa. And then the if you want to go to the beach, if you want to go to the Bay Islands in the Caribbean, which I uh, strongly suggest, <laughs> you go there. So they're, they're very well interconnected. Therefore, we have a unified um, dialect. Both is part of the oral vernacular norm. It is not studied in school, um, and, uh, but, it's, but, it's, but, but it's very readily used in, in oral speech. Whereas two is part of the written academic norm. So if you want to, um, if you're writing more formally, then you use two. But if you're texting someone, then you might use both. 
And they are both considered to be used in informal contexts. Of course, two will be used in, in more formal of the informal contexts. Um, and then usted is used in both norm, it's part of both norms and is used both in formal and informal contexts. So consequently, we have a, a duality of attitudes with regards to both. Um, on the one hand, we have positive attitudes uh, where we see both as a pronoun of spontaneity, uh, of solidarity, but then on the other hand, there are negative attitudes where um, both is seen as an uneducated way of speaking. And there's more work that needs to uh, be done in, in, with that regard. Um, so a little bit of a historical background on Vos. Vos comes from the uh, Latin second personal, uh, second person plural, plural pronoun vos, which by the fourth century was already used in singular, in the, in the singular form, to refer to someone of a higher status. Um, and, and that's the singular form. And it was also used in the plural form in any context. To remain as a singular default pronoun to be used uh, with someone of the same social status. That was pretty much the uh, system that was that stayed for uh, for a long period of time. Of course, there were some social pragmatic changes that happened all, happened along the way. But then one very dra 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 uh, dramatic, uh, dramatic change happened by the 14th century. It was that was no longer used as a, a plural uh, pronoun, and it was used not only to not to address someone of higher status, but to address someone of lower status. So that, 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 that was that was an interesting shift right there. Do was extended to any informal context, and vosotros was created to differentiate between the singular both and then the plural both from previous centuries. And uh, as we can see here, vos, vosotros is created by joining vos, and then the word otros, which means others. And that would be the plural uh, for this form. It kept the same verb desinences as uh, we see in vos. So it has the same uh, verbal morphology, um, except that this was used in singular, in the same, uh, referred to one person. By the 15th century, when um, the discovery of the New World happened, Vos was brought to the New World, and uh, it was still used to refer to someone of lower status. The colonizers, of course, thought that the indigenous people were of lower status, so they used it uh, readily with them. But it was also extended to, um, to uh, all informal contexts. Um, two was extended even further, and it was remain the same. By the 17th century, something else happened. Because we no longer had uh, a, a pronoun of deference uh, in Peninsular or Spanish, usted was created. So vos uh, remained the same, do remain the same, vosotros lost some of its ground um, in some contexts, and it was used, and it's still used now, uh, in informal contexts. And then usted, the singular form, and usted as the plural form, was used only in formal contexts uh, to refer either to a singular uh, person or to more than one person. And then finally, by the 18th century, vos had completely disappeared from the, peninsula, from the peninsula. It remained in Latin America, uh, especially in those regions that were not in close contact with the Spanish crown, like Central America. Do um, uh, remained in both regions as well. Um, vosotros remained only in Peninsular Spanish. Um, it did not stay in Latin America because uh, they wanted to differentiate themselves from Spanish Spanish. And usted is um, it's used in both in both regions as well. So that's a little bit of the history that we need to keep in mind. Um, something that we need to if we're going to remember something of all of this is that vos and vosotros originally had the same verbal inflections. Okay, so the Central American Poseo. 
Uh, this is a table proposed by Bias Organeta um, in which we see the verb designates for uh, Central American Museo, in which the differentized final word inflections that are now present in vos with vos the vosotros pronoun have become monophonized. And they, and they keep the stress except for the predator. And this is, this is pretty much uh, true, except that Ronald Blanco and as well uh, Rivera Mills, they have suggested in more current studies on Central American Boseo that um, the future indicative is no longer, has no longer kept this paradigm and has completely become homologous to the two forms in which uh, in which the uh, final inflection is now is no longer es but as for all um, verb conjugations. With all of this in mind, I came up with a few research questions. Uh, one, what is the present verb paradigm of Honduran Museo? And two, has it conserved its previously attested verb inflections, or has it taken inflections from the two verb paradigm? And I hypothesize that Honduran Museo will uh, present a verb paradigm similar to that of Costa Rica Museo, which uh, was studied by Rojas Blanco that I mentioned previously, uh, in which all uh, tense aspect and moods conserve their own verb inflections, with the exception of the future indicative, which is homologous now to the two forms. All right, so now we can get into the fun part, at least for me, uh, the methodology. Um, OK, I have 80 participants. They were all teenagers uh, between the ages of 14 and 17. Um, and this was because in previous studies uh, done by uh, Pinkerton in, in Guatemala and Torrejón in Chile and whereas in Uruguay, it has, uh, they, have, uh, they have seen that uh, teenagers have had an important role at maintaining the use of voz and in the case of Uruguay, in reviving it because it was about to be lost. So that's why I focus on this group. Um, they were all born and raised in uh, one of the three largest cities. And I wanted to keep this constant so that I could generalize my findings. And um, they were all from the high middle and upper class. And these are the classes that are the educated classes and the ones that are going to be in close contact with two forms, uh, through literary works, through films, and maybe through friends that they have from other countries that used to. So if there are any innovations, it will be in this in this in this class that, um, that they will that they will appear. I uh, gave them a survey that they needed to fill out. Um, and this is part of a much sorry about that, and this part of a much larger uh, study that is underway at the moment. Studying not only the morphology of Mosel but also the sociochromatic uses of it in the in Honduras. And this was a short section of the larger survey in which they had to fill out six incomplete sentences, uh, like this one. Um, and they had to choose one of the verb inflections, either the monophonized poseo form, the tu form, or the original poseo form that is now present with vosotros. And uh, just as for your information, uh, this sentence says, um, every morning you take a long time to get ready. Each sentence is focused on one of the following uh, TAMs. Simple present indicative, uh, simple future indicative, present perfect indicative. And here I want to mention a few things. Um, I added this uh, uh, TAM just to be complete because the form of S, which is the auxiliary verb to have, um, was never attested in Central America except for uh, El Salvador uh, by Lipsky. But I just wanted to be complete, so that's why I added it. Um, the simple present subjunctive, the present uh, perfect subjunctive, and then finally the imperative. And these are all TANs that uh, have been um, proven to have their own wholesale inflections. When I analyzed my results, I divided them, uh, the responses into three groups. Uh, two forms, both forms A, which have the monophonized forms, and both forms B, 
which have have different nice original forms um, for both. And then I conducted a percentage analysis um, to determine which forms were favored. All right, so my results. To present my results, I uh, put together a bar graph to that summarizes uh, my findings. And um, as we can see here, um, and I apologize that this is in Spanish, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, uh, in blue, we have the two form. In red, we have the uh, monophthalized both form. And in green, we have the different guys both form. And I want to focus on this session here, where we can see that the, um, the that the verb inflections that were selected are pretty much completely homologized to the, the two forms. So I prefer both of them. Um, and then finally, on the, uh, for the other TAMs, we see that, uh, yes, the Wolf's form, the monophthalic Central American Wolf's form, uh, was preferred for the most part. But we do see the infiltration of the two forms. So this is suggestive of a uh, change that is in progress at the, at the moment. And so uh, further study needs to be done with other social classes to see um, if this has extended to those areas as well, um, and, and in what direction this is going to be going in. So I think that that's pretty cool. Um, and just to summarize my discussion, a simple uh, future and present perfect indicative, we show a virtually complete homologation with the two forms. Um, cantares, tu cantarás, and la vez mandado, which was never tested in, in, in Central America, except for El Salvador, tu has mandado, and those are uh, the, the two forms. Um, there we go. And um, uh, for all other TAMs, those uh, forms, the monophthalized forms that were preferred, um, to a certain extent, of course, and um, two forms are infiltrating the spaces of those. To conclude, I want to present to you a preliminary paradigm as it would be presented in a grammar book, even though it will never, it has never been done. Uh, a grammar book in Central America, um, where we see that everything that is not highlighted uh, is the same for the two forms in for these uh, TAMs. Um, in green, we have the ones that, in terms of my study, that were percentage-wise more frequent, uh, more frequently selected by the participants, um, and they kept the most uh, definences uh, over here. And then in blue, we have the, um, the ones that are now homologized to the two forms. Um, I would also like to uh, quote uh, Roman Blanco um, because this was at the subtext of my study. Um, and uh, she said, Jose Baradine's properly studied can constitute valuable, valuable tools not only for the morpholinguistic field, but also to favor communicative efficacy and the recognition of our national identity. And here she was uh, talking about Costa Rican national identity, but I would, I'm extending that to uh, Honduras as well. And, also in America. Um, and finally, my country, the, the contribution of this study uh, so far, uh, if this is a preliminary study, more has to be done. It fills the gap uh, of linguistic data coming from countries such as Honduras, which are not very much studied linguistically. It provides updated information to add to the overall knowledge of subject pronouns and morphosyntax in general. And finally, it legitimizes Boseo as a key and as a still current characteristic of Honduran Spanish, favoring the recognition of Honduran national identity. Thank you. Any questions, comments, suggestions? Uh, that is a good question. Um, well, let me tell you. My father is a high school principal. 
And so I talked to him, and he just told the student, well, you'll get pizza if you <laughs> 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 And so that's how I got it. Just, just, yeah. just yes. So um, the innovating forms are the simple future and present perfect. Yes, sir. So do you have any idea speculation why it's so Conjugation or mm -hmm. um, currently uh, in Central America, especially in North Spanish, especially with the future, with the simple future, the morphological future that uh, I presented is it, not really used very much anymore, um, especially in oral speech. It, it has been um, replaced by, not completely, by the perfect future with the uh, to go get plus up plus into there. So, I, I, because they, they don't use that, I'm speculating, because they, that's not used frequently in oral speech, um, once it comes to writing, because in writing, then you use it. Um, then you go with that. Because again, both, you will never see that paradigm written anywhere. So there, there's no paradigm that they can go back to just to check how they, they should conjugate the verb. So would it be fair to say then that it's one that's less frequent or less well known? Yes, at the yes, at the moment. What was what was very interesting for me personally was um, the fact that uh, that the present tense has quite a high percentage of the two forms. Because this we use all the time. Um, so, so that was that was pretty interesting for me. Uh, do you think the fact that you were asking for your participants to write in there had any influence on perhaps their using the form for that books? Uh, absolutely. Uh, especially with, well, this is very clear with this one participant that used the uh, diphthongized nice form, which is, no, we don't use it in Honduras. And, um, and also by the fact that in the written form, when they are writing books, they spell with a Z, which voice with a Z means voice, meaning that they really don't even know how to spell this word because it's never written. So I, I yes, absolutely, that, that, has, that has a lot to do. So I would like to do something similar to this, but uh, orally. Uh, can I follow up just a second? Mm -hmm. And just uh, anecdotally, being from Honduras, have you noted that this sort of extensive use of two forms uh, or with, with both, or, yes. or not at all? No. Okay. So that, that was also surprising, because to me, this, this was very surprising, because I, I personally have never heard, to me, using do uh, with another Honduran would be very pretentious, um, and not natural at all. I actually have to think hard when I'm, like, when I'm teaching here, uh, and I obviously don't use both. Uh, I have to think before I'm actually saying something, because I have to use it. Other questions? Yes. I think that in the in your questionnaire you asked for a R verb, right? Mm -hmm. Which I assume that is because the most common verb. Right. I was wondering if you are thinking in your future studies to include E R and I R verbs too, and then what is your hypothesis in the uses of it, or how because they are less common? Right. Yes. So do you think that that would be um, additional? I, I, I did, yes, absolutely. I, 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 I am hypothesizing that, yes, for the ER and IR verbs, especially the IR verbs, um, the uh, trend will be, will be you know, less to use the two forms. But um, I did use ER and IR verbs, um, this is a composite uh, result here for the future, because I wanted to see, um, because Lipsky said that it was only the AR verbs that were homologized to do. Um, so I wanted to, so in that one I did use the, uh, all three conjugations, uh, but yes, absolutely I wanted to use the other the other two for future studies. Yeah. I, I just want to talk about this, but I was in Korea in a traditional sense. Being being a sort of cultural thing, like they had everything else like all of the only form they said. Mm -hmm. was the present tense stress. 
Yes. Right. And everything else they said, at least they claimed in that time, was the same. For what we do. You yes. Yes. Okay. Interesting. So in order to learn to use both, all you have to do is switch the pronoun. And it was present at the time. Right. 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 So, <laughs> which I think I see is not necessarily right. right. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. it's fine. Yeah. 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 That's it. That, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is their their personal factor? Mm -hmm. uh, it's possible that that's more of a recent thing. Uh, the study that Rojas Blanco uh, published was in 2003, um, and by then she mentions this has never been published in a book or anything, a grammar book or anything. So this was like a, a bound thing, and that was, oh, okay. Okay. It was okay. It was a global okay. thing, but yeah. it's still the culture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you. Thank you.